Hello and welcome to The Good, The Scars and The Rugby, as always in partnership with our friends at Allianz. Uh, Scazzy Legs is moving house this week. I am yet to see photos of this new house, which makes it sound like an excuse, but people assure me there is a new house in the offing and she's been very busy. Um, uh, so we'll get an update of that next time. Lucky me, however, not alone. I'm in the studio and I'm joined by three incredible entrepreneurs, um, absolute superpower businesswomen. Somehow they also find the time to play rugby at a very high level in the Prem 15s for Harlequins, Worcester, Warriors and Wasps respectively. Welcoming to the show, Emma Swords, Steph Evans and Flo Williams. How are you all? Welcome to the party. Thanks for having me. Very well. I'm so excited. There's so many plants around. Thank you for having me. Many, many of them, don't tell anyone, are in fact not real organic no way. plants. Yep. No way. Um, they grow in a room without light. And so um, they were also made without light. <laughs> I wasn't going to tell anybody. Your secret's <laughs> safe with me. <laughs> um, I don't know if any of you caught the period episode, but I just have to say to all of the men in particular who commented on that and tweeted and responded on all kinds of social platforms, uh, who felt like they really learned something from this experience. Thank you, uh, because I was really impressed by the scale of the enthusiasm. So thank you uh, to all the gents who loved uh, the period episode. Um, it's great to have everyone here in off-season. What are all of you doing in this country? Because I feel like all of the rugby-playing women I follow are somewhere wearing very little clothing in the sunshine. Yeah, they're all on their third trip now, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, I did a bit of that, but uh, back in sunny England now. You guys are here hustling. I mean, the hustle culture is deep within. Steph is like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'm like dead behind the eyes. Every time I see anybody post like any of their vacation pics right now, I'm I'm a little bit like, I feel like I'm doing recovery wrong or something. I'm like, yeah, again, I'm failing. But um, I I am kind of doing like a like 10% of that, but in like a much less exotic way because it's in the middle of the Midlands and like in a bunch of like, you know, near farmers. And I'm like, don't mind me. I'm just trying to keep up. But um, I I feel like I spent most of this season anyways really thinking like I'm I can't wait to catch up on XYZ and and get all these things done as soon as off season hits and then I'm gonna have like, you know, one or two days off a week and I'm really gonna, you know, for once in my life, like ace my recovery on whoop and none of that has happened. I feel like I've been busier than ever. <laughs> this point, I'm like, I, yeah, right now I'm like, I need rugby to come back. So my HIV is like less of, like a, obsessive and terrible. So I don't know. It's good though. What about you guys? I had my two weeks of mobs. Could do another two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Christ, I'm surprised you came back. It was tricky. We almost didn't. It was a long, long journey back. Mm. Um, and your voice flow. What is happening to that? It's actually not related to drinking. I did. Promise. I honestly, I gave it a really good go, and and it maintained. And then I had a few days down. And it hit me when, as soon as I let my guard down, um, got some lovely little sore throats coming in. Oh, which was good. Mm. Sorry, but it did manage um, Milan, Greece, and Toulouse pretty well. So I'll take it. You know, yeah, you one of them wow. in your skimpy, mm. skimpy outfits, weren't you? I wouldn't like skimpy about wild wearing. <laughs> 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 So do you guys, outside of playing against one another on the Prem Fifteen circuit, have you come across each other before? Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. Okay. So this isn't just the first meeting. No. Me no. and Steph, we've not really yeah, I spent think, too much time, but you know, I, feel, I, I, feel, I feel like at least over screens, Matt. Yeah, we've yeah. met. I think there's not many people in the Prem 15 who you wouldn't at least feel like they're your friend, even if you hadn't spoke to them before. Yeah, le yeah legit, legit. That's a very nice way of putting I've it. I've had, <laughs> I've had like for different media things before people say things like, um, I, I could like show, show us what your game face like is on game day. Like think about the other team and stuff. I'm like, half of them are your mates. Like every single time you're like, yeah. it's just, it just seems really weird when they kind of, people assume that, you know, you'd be able to have some sort of like animosity when everyone, everyone knows each other. Exactly, yeah, apart true. from Saris, but you know, that's fine. <laughs> and outside of storming around on a rugby pitch and um, occasionally sunning ourselves, um, you guys all have really interesting business ventures. Emma, you founded Bonsi. I did. Uh, which is a bucket hat and scrunchy company. And I mean, the list of logos on the Bonsi website, teams that have been Bonsied are plentiful. Uh, Steph, you've got Ruggett, uh, FC, RFC, is it RFC? 
a good question. It is RFC. Yeah. It is RFC. Sorry, <laughs> forget good. RFC. Um, specialising in women's rugby clothing and accessories. If you watch No Women, you No Try, you'll, you'll know uh, Steph and love her voice. If you haven't, then you're in the right place because she's got a lot on her mind. <laughs> um, Flo, you have an interesting uh, professional kind of uh, ambit because you work creatively. T- t- tell us what you do. Um, so previously I founded my own agency called the Perception Agency because I felt like there was a bit of a gap in marketing of women's sport mm. and the audiences who wanted it, they're slightly different to male audiences and did a lot of work in that and then really lucky to get the opportunity to work with Matter, who are a creative sports marketing agency as their women's sports lead, which was a role that they created because it just sort of backs the importance of having someone in the room who is purely there to make sure that women's sport is being represented right and the marketing of it happens correctly because there's not always, unfortunately, that many women in that part of the industry and having someone who gets it from both sides as an athlete, um, I feel like it is pretty important. So yeah, lucky to be doing that. That's really cool. I mean, it's really interesting because it's it's more in what I do from a, from a day job perspective, <laughs> but it's also just you get to really work at the um, insights and planning and um, perception level of the sport, um, which is really probably a nice balance to what when you play, right? Yeah, for sure. Like it's quite, it's nice because sometimes you're on the ground and you're like, God, I wish this would change. And then, then like two days later, you're in a meeting and they're talking about how to change it. And it's great to actually be in a world where there's an opportunity to change those things. And a lot of it is like behavioral change. Like unfortunately, we're in a society that. 50 years ago, men believed that women can't play sport because their like uteruses might fall out. And like <laughs> people are literally still alive now who were brought up in that world. So mm. having to do that sort of cultural behavioral shift, I think it, marketing is really responsible for it. So it's nice to be in a position to be able to affect that. That's really cool. So you were you were a dough baller, speaking of marketing, dough yeah. baller of the week. Yeah, we got that from... Um, James Haskell on uh, off the podcast and we got a load of free dominoes for that and we put together a pretty nifty video where we ate a load of pizza in the gym which I think the dominoes liked and we liked as well to be fair best time I've ever had in a gym <laughs> <laughs> love it she really gets it you know yeah I'm sure the brand uh, loved it as well you were at the that match where you guys beat Quinns good season I, I was um Oh, it's been an interesting one with Voss. I think at one time we probably had our entire starting line out injured, which was great. Mm. Um, but that is rugby, so you just sort of get on with it. And I think uh, I remember we played Bristol away and my outside player was Cleaner Maloney, who's a hooker. Was, she still had a two on her back, but there was a one in front of it. And um, <laughs> that was fun for us. But I think that's just sort of like the roller coaster that is Wasps, mm. that you sort of just do anything that... You, that that comes really and um, yeah beating Quinns at CBS Arena was obviously a massive highlight for us um, mm. hadn't quite managed it when we had them at Twickenham but it was good to do it at home Emma you moved you you made the big move from Saracens to Harlequins yeah. speaking of Quinns twice twice yeah Jeez. I've done it twice look at you um, just up and down up and down you know you, sometimes you just really have to to try things out mm-hmm. and then try again mm-hmm. and then you get a good call. Yeah, call. we felt really left out of Wasps. You tried every London club apart from us. You've gone past us twice. <laughs> but that was the problem. I was passing loads of clubs to get, to get Saris. Um, yeah, Gerard Mullen gave me a call again on a sunbed in Portugal. Oh. Um, and Impeccable uh, tan. Yeah. Always being maintained. Yeah, always. And uh, yeah, I, I thought, again, with work, lifestyle, all the rest of it, there's a lot of travel going to North London, passing Quinns, which is five minutes from mine wasps and then heading up to Sarri so it sound it was a great call and um I think the what was on Moscow Mules helped as well I was like yeah that's yeah. that's me yeah. that's me Gerard and it was a good move for lifestyle we're going to talk about Quinn's at the big game uh, a, a little later on I have other things on the agenda before we get to the big game and Quinn's and um, those khaki outfits <laughs> um Steph, you're front row for Worcester Warriors, former Bristol. Um, you're also the exotic one here with the more interesting accent. Only in this country. If we were all doing this back home, everybody would be obsessed with all three of you and mm. pay, completely ignore me. <laughs> so it's all about location, really. But Has Raget RFC seen a bit of a boost after the release of No Woman, No Try? Yeah, it really has. And... Um, the kind of the cool thing about it is up until now, like we've done literally no advertising and everything that's that, we, that we've done that's been um, an increase on the profit line has always gone right back into product, into product development and stuff. And so um, it's nice to see 
what happens when the brand does get a little bit of something that looks like publicity or or marketing or or just gets in front of more people who aren't aware of it because you know it's like advertising like the whole the whole idea behind advertising is trying to sell something to somebody and um the the all of the uptick in sales and the and the inquiries we've gotten and like a lot of the the chat we've had from different clubs and the interest we've had in, in custom kits and in and being suppliers and stuff has just made it abundantly aware that it's not something that I really need to worry about selling. It's just whether or not people know about it. You know, mm. I don't, you know, I, I, I was kind of wondered, especially in different markets, like I wonder if this is going to have to be a hard sell and I really don't think it is going, it mm. doesn't suggest it's going to be have to have to be a hard sell. It's just whether or not people are aware of it more than anything. I was yawning on to my colleagues about this conversation earlier today because I was so excited before I came in. I, I gave them all the speech. Um, and they were like, oh, okay, simmer down, lady. Um, about the shorts, um, because a lot of people have not heard the whole story about the shorts and the fact that you have basically designed a pair of rugby shorts actually for women's bodies did you physically do that yourself like were you cutting fabric and figuring it out at the beginning yes and not not anymore no <laughs> but at the beginning I was um, I either started with like altering some different shorts that I had that were kind of in my opinion close to something that I liked and seeing if I if I liked the fit differently then um, or getting getting things altered and having some patterns cut um, but the the way that the the shorts line that we have now basically got developed was I really had had to think about if I'm going to solve the problem of, of us not having kit that that suits what we're trying to do here being female rugby players like I don't want to just you know make it girly and pink and call it a job done you know like I want to be like what what actually and not just not just my opinion of what's good but what mm. like the, what everybody does right because it's you can't just you know create things in a vacuum for one person and expect it to suit a whole community so I did a lot of of research and polling and asked some really awkward questions to people I just met at tournaments I'm like hi you look like you might be a size 12 yes no and they're like yeah cool I need you know I'm like okay I, I need like 50 that's quite more. a line Hi. Hi. Are you a twelve? No. Are you like hi? I do, and the good news is like I'm I'm all, like awkward already, and I don't have a lot of um, concern about hiding that anymore at this point in my life. So it's it really frees you up to have conversations when you stop caring about that kind of stuff. But um, I I wanted to have like a, a data set, um, a, a fairly large data set for every single size that we do, and and really solve the problem kind of in individual like by, like size by size so for what? each player. Did you take your measuring tape to yes, rugby tournaments? Yes, like a crazy person. Like and I, then? And I, and I would ask people, I'm like, okay, tell me, like, where do you, how, how far down your leg do you want your shorts? Like, show me. And they would show me and I'd measure. I'm like, all right, um, like, how tight to your leg do you want them? And where, and like, what's like the first thing you put on, like when you, when you are buying new rugby shorts, like what's your number one worry? Like, are, where are you concerned it's not going to fit? What do you, what? frustrates you the most like tell me about your favorite pair like what do you like about them what do they do well what how would you, what would you change just asking like a bunch of questions and the cool thing is that everybody I spoke to I never had anybody who was sort of like mm, no they're like oh let me tell you they all had like yeah. they were like here here are every like mm -hmm. all my thoughts everything that's ever bothered me about the short these ones I hate for the following reasons you know people were really really helpful that's and a big thing isn't it like when you're running around yeah uh, and you're sweaty and it's not the most comfortable sport in the best of days yeah like the shorts were a big thing. They always are a big thing, even always. in the kits that, that we have now. Um, women have bigger bums. Yeah. On a whole. Yeah, like so, news um, flash. I don't yeah. Know. yeah. I think it's everyone so... has like that one pair of shorts as well that you've probably had since you were like 16. That yeah. were, like, they, you'll yeah. wear them till there's like holes everywhere yeah. because they fit you so well because you yeah. know that they're like gold dust. Yeah, they're the short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you start like rationing your wear in them. And so I was like, tell me about, like, every, everybody's got something like that. I'm like, tell me about your short. Like, <laughs> what's yeah. what makes them magic and why, what, you know, where'd you get them from and all that. And the short is not just about what it looks like, which was the most compelling part for me about the, the contribution that you made to the documentary is that this isn't just, people can't dismiss this as, oh, girls just want to look hot. And they do. Mm. And that is entirely justified. And not a crime. Not a crime at all. We're so here for people feeling confident and strong and empowered. However, there is an actual injury risk here if you play wearing kit that, hey, who knew doesn't suit your body? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and everyone, I'm sure everyone here has seen, especially like, um, you know, if, when you're playing at the lower levels or in, in they coming up in, in age grade and there's somebody who like whatever the size range that the, the club has bought for the shorts at the time doesn't doesn't suit the play playing group and there's people in shorts that are you know if they had a choice they probably would be wearing something two or three or size significant amount of sizes bigger right and like 
you don't have to be, I think, you don't have a master's in SNC to look at that person and know that that's not how they would normally run. Or they that's not like their full flexibility range or like their mobility range within their scrum. Like those are, that's that's tension and, and, and strain and on hip flexors and all sorts of soft tissue that you're not, that is completely preventable. It's just a pair of shorts. You know, like, like rugby, you said, rugby's not a comfortable game at the best of times. It's also not a game without injury risk at the best of times. Like I don't know why we would add another facet into that. Is that it what seems dumb. was your injury when you... In yeah. a documentary, it was yeah, fun. I used to get especially when like when shorts weren't like didn't you know um didn't have a lot of stretch especially I used to always have issues where like they would like ride like ride up on my leg and then I would have like a little bit of, like too much fabric in the in my hip like crease like mm. pulling and in the scrum especially like a tight head you know I I always like start with a split stance and and I would get like hip flexor strain like sore I would like like have sore hip flexors and I'm like this is from my clothes this is dumb right like mm. it's like one thing to, it's one thing to like you know have a rugby injury it's another thing to just be like my shorts hurt me today that's dumb right do you know what I was struck by so my sister recently had a baby and we were talking about maternity clothes but also the clothes for after you have the baby so when you have had a c-section and you've got a cut on your abdomen you obviously can't wear stuff that that chafes mm. on that specific spot but also you need things that button down so you can breastfeed and get your boobs out quickly and um, easily and without taking your entire top off. And I was like, we have so many clothing options available to women because so many women have children. The number of women who play rugby should allow for there to be such a much wider range of clothing options mm -hmm. available to people who mm. play rugby. Would it not just be simpler to play rugby in cycling shorts? So you have something <coughs> that has, or is that is that fabric too thin? So you want something that's a little looser, that's kind of wider and allows more movement, like in all of the conversations that you've yeah, had yeah. with women. I mean, a, a number of people do wear some sort of base layer under their shorts um, in, in different lengths, depending on the player yeah. and, their, and their own personal preference, mm. or um, especially if they're trying to like offset some sort of chub rub or something mm. like that. Mm. Um, but uh, the kind of the overarching there seems to be kind of like two main main ideas from the feedback or the data that mm. I've gotten. And one is like, is where is, is longevity of the garment, mm. um, depending on the, the fabric content for something that's like some sort of spandex or base layer stuff. It's, it's probably not going to stand up to what we tend to put clothes through, um, in the course of a season, especially like weekend mm. after weekend. It's just, um, especially on like turf and stuff. It just, they don't last as long, you know. I don't, mm. I don't know if you, I don't know if you guys ever wear base layers, but like those tend to get holes in them before your short, your your rugby shorts yeah. do. Mm. And then there is like a, a certain level of um, of aesthetic to it. Like rugby does have an aesthetic, mm. like a classic look. And 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 I know you see when, every time that like the the regardless of if it's men's or women's, every time that we kind of move the the classic normal kit, you know, one degree away from what it used to be. People always Uproar. have opinions about it, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I and I get it, right? Because 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 apparel, you know, apparel is like more than just you know what we have to put on to to do a thing. It's it's like it's like self referential, but it's also referential to the past and everything that we've, you know, everything that's come before us and stuff. So like I personally, I love like, you know, vintage rugby aesthetic and what it looks like, and and I think it's like things, you know, things that we wear that look like that look like you know what our sport you originated in and for, as far as apparel is pretty cool and anytime you, know. you drive change between the men's and the women's game exactly i don't think that's gonna help yeah really mm. so as, as close as you can keep it exactly the same and also like you just don't, you wouldn't even want to hear the comments you the see comments. Like girls running yeah. around in cycling shorts yeah even on a it was just day. um yeah that would that wouldn't be great yeah. So Bonsi, is that right? Is, yeah, Did I say it. that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I, I do speak my second language here, so <laughs> I always just double check. Um, why did you start your range? So I was like, uh, so it came mainly from the travel from Sari's to, which is a bit of a strange starting point for a headwear company. But basically I had a friend who um, he owns Slide Tribe, which I think maybe a lot of the listeners um, they've stocked loads of, um, I think Wasp might have had a Bristol yeah, would definitely have had them. Yeah. Um, so sliders essentially. So custom footwear. And, um, I was like competing at the time and, uh, then driving up to Sari's after getting up at 5am, driving up to Sari's, finishing at half nine, driving back down to Sari's. So I was like, the work life balance <laughs> wasn't great. Where can I work essentially from home, um, or from a laptop? I think that's what we have all kind of come yeah. to same thing. Uh, Sus is is quite good, and um, so I was like, "What's another cool accessory that people enjoy wearing?" And it's not it's it's quite fun. Um, and I thought 
bucket hats. Why not? So I started with the bucket hats. Um, and God, there was some teething to that. That really was. There was some real crap <laughs> that came out from uh, from Bonsi to begin with. Um, managed to get some other supplies. I'm sure you've had teething yeah, like to definitely. begin with. It's like, okay, my name is to this, so I've got to make sure it comes through. Um, and then uh, the scrunchies followed. I was like, what's in that? It can't just be hats. There's there's other bits to it. And then. Uh, there's there was a brand in Australia who were quite big in in the scrunchies and I was like maybe custom would be cool because they kind of do colours and stuff but they didn't they don't print on their fabric and um, I think Quinns were my first Sarries um, and I printed out some scrunchies again great teething uh, for the first bits um, but then lockdown came and I had so much time to oh. to um, to spend on that and I stopped PTing. Um, and I had, well, months to, to crack it. And strangely enough, I think what was quite nice about um, the custom orders, it kept teams together during lockdown. It was like, oh, what can we do as a squad? Mm. Oh, let's get some custom hats in. And thank God the, the sun was shining pretty much the whole of lockdown, <laughs> yeah, so people really enjoyed helped. that. Mm. Um, so from there, it was like, uh, let's just keep pushing it and pushing it. Um, and then I have dipped off it. It was like, again, when rugby, I feel like rugby this year stepped up even more as a demand. Yeah. Um, so I've now got other people helping me out. Uh, yeah, just a few little minions. You're an employer. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. Well, uh, yeah, almost, almost. But she, uh, she's great. She's actually out there watching at the minute, good old Ellie. But um, yeah, it's just, it's grown. And now I think that we've got some good off time. I can now start to, teeth a bit more and, and push a bit more so we're looking at stocking a few more like universities and stuff like that so yeah it's been good fun it's it's not easy is it like the whole no. apparel and particularly with the um shipping stuff definitely shipping's I, been absolutely i hear you on that especially like, as like we're i don't know about you but we're expanding into like you know different countries you have a shipping center in the states and right now opening one in australia and it's like you know, when I first started this, I remember having like a, a conversation with somebody about how dumb it was. We didn't have clothes. And I was like, why doesn't people make like, women's rugby stuff? How hard can it be? And mm. like, the number of times I like eat those words on a, yeah. like, on a weekly basis yeah. now. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that was naive. What's the thing you wish you knew sooner? Um, probably to... Like, like two things one one to to stop just doubting the whole thing like for, probably for the first solid year that I had the business I in my head like to myself and to other people I was talking about it as if it was a science experiment I'm mm. like I guess we'll just see right like you know I give, I've given it a little try and we'll see if there's a market for it and looking back on it I'm like embarrassed that I said that because obviously there's a market for it I think it just goes to show like how deeply ingrained some of the the messaging around like the di the difference or the lesser than quality that women's women's sports sometimes gets assigned is is like if somebody who is me and is fairly into it you know still doubt is, is at one point doubted the the survivability of my business I think that says a lot about like mm -hmm. you know how deeply that 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 runs in our in our community because I for a while wasn't entirely sure it was going to work. Um, and and to just to ask for help when I needed it more, I, I I and not feel weird about it, or I like ask people if they want to collaborate on stuff for a little while. I was again pretty sure I'm like no one probably would want to, like they would, no I don't want to, I don't want to inconvenience anybody or like nobody you know they probably wouldn't want to, and I've never had anybody be like no you know, mm. or, you know so I'm like I don't know why I was just being I think I was just being like weird and shy and I should have just stopped that earlier I think. If you could give yourself advice early on, don't rush it. Don't, don't don't ship out shit if you you know allow things to to take place and um i guess use your time a bit more effectively i had to learn that process um because i think when you're starting a brand you're like okay i don't want anyone else to get out there or i or it needs to just happen like i need it's actually when you look at so many massive brands now you you listen to how many years it took them to build even like a small following mm -hmm. um and then when you realize how many people you've stopped it's just then again being patient they're going to come back like uh, teams expand more people come in mm -hmm. and so on so just be patient with that um and uh again ask for help like uh, when i first started i had somebody who was helping me and it was great and then they kind of left and then um because you know your ways 
about like your, I don't know, shipping labels or um, bits and pieces or how you talk to one, like university is very different to how you talk to grassroots rugby mm -hmm. um, or corporate deals or whatever. Um, you know, if you could just delegate that little bit more, but that's that tends to be the hardest thing. When it I is. listen to like um, business podcasts or anything, delegation is tough because you know how you do it. Heaven forbid someone gets it wrong, what you claim, well, deem to be wrong. Mm. Um, and then it's a wonder of time and strength because you've got to get in the gym. No, you're so sorry. it's like... But that's what I can't sorry. wrap my head around. I don't know how you do both. Because anyone who's ever started a business will tell you it literally just becomes, I mean, you go nuts because it's on your mind all the time. Like you can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. And you manage to balance it with also, you know, just quickly playing some Prem 15s matches in, in between. Yeah, I mean, and again, like things like shipping at the minute is a nightmare. And, and you've got people going, where's my order? And I'm like... Uh, I actually don't know. No, none of the world knows at current. You know that it's been it's been it's been really hard. Yeah. Um, and then like you're getting emails through, and like your SNC is like, can you get off your phone now? And I'm like, mm. this is you know I'm talking to the other side of the world right now. This is their time frame. So it's it's not easy. But then again, like most of what we do, we walk ourselves into it. We choose to do it this way, yeah. and it actually relieves. Do you introduce sunset. yourself as a rugby player or as an entrepreneur? Entrepreneur. Yeah. Both. Both. Mm. I'd probably talk about work first, yeah. Mm. Depends who you're talking to. Yeah, I guess so. Who you're selling to. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Your, yours is so paramount. Yours would sell so well, as in, I'm a female player. I've experienced yeah, you know, it's like a level, issues. It's like a level of authenticity, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I usually say both. Yeah. Unless it's like, you yeah. know, I'm on the phone with the bank and it's just easier to say one. But I yeah. usually say both. I'm, yeah. I'm just selling like your sevens uh, tournament photo is going to look so much better with a custom bucket hat on. <laughs> it's a lifestyle. And they would. <laughs> I was and say, they would. Yeah. Lifestyle brands are real. And with sevens tournaments all over and people are more likely to have, uh, you know, some time out there at the moment, this time of the year, to get some kit. Uh, but also people are thinking about preseason. And I think... Mm. That the bucket hats and the scrunchies should be part of the kit decision. I'm just saying. I agree. And they're coming through. Some of oh. the boys' prem guys are getting in contact now, which is great. Oh, yes. Um, so, yeah, they, they're coming through. And then it's so good when you're in this world, you can just go, oh, do you know so and so? And then yeah. it's just, it's all about who you know. And then, Lo and behold, your stuff starts getting out. Your network is your net worth. Yeah. Now, it speaking really of helps. someone with a big network, Sue Anstis, um, she was uh, on the same documentary uh, with Steph Evans, but she's also worthwhile following on Twitter. She put out a note. And, you know, I read this note and I was like, oh, I wish I came up with <laughs> this one. So I'm just going to read it so that it lives in my voice at the very least. But uh, uh, props to Sue Anstis. She tweeted... It's time, is it time to review women's sports kit? The next few months will be huge for the profile of women's sport. TV coverage and crowds set to break records at global events, including Wimbledon, the Euros, the Commonwealth Games, Athletics World Champs, the Tour de France Femmes. I love how the increased coverage of strong, talented women finally is receiving the equal exposure to men. And it can help overturn centuries of broader societal stereotypes where women have been viewed as somehow less than men. Sport is unique in that cultural impact it has with the quality we see on screen then rippling out to be reflected elsewhere in society. But with this very equality in sport we celebrate, there is also the subtlety that is being undermined by the clothing we provide for our elite female athletes. Or what if it is being undermined? She says the magnificent woman at Wimbledon taking to center court in skirts and dresses, conforming to that traditional femininity rather than just dressing for performance outright full stop, wearing whites because it's traditional, despite its impracticality for any woman or girl on her period. We're back at the period chat, Maxon. <laughs> Female gymnasts wearing high cut leotards with sequins. Anyone who's worn a sequin will know that stuff scratches. It's yeah. not practical. Tiny pretty razors. Ouch. <laughs> While men compete in tunics and leggings. The national kit on offer for track and field athletes at the World Championships this summer. The women's choice is bikini briefs and a crop top, which means your stomach is out, or a high cut all-in-one swimming costume style outfit, which means, well, you are going for a very very serious wax. <laughs> so the men has knee-length lycra bottoms with vest tops. 
No manscaping required. The men don't have to reveal their stomachs, their buttocks, their thighs, and they're all competing in front of millions of people. Female rugby players from all six nations represent their countries in white shorts, because that's what men wear. Never mind that most rugby shorts aren't designed for women's bodies. Yes, we've already talked about that. Netball and hockey teams compete at the Commonwealth Games in dresses. Now, this is traditional, but that doesn't make it right in 2022. And imagine the reaction if the Lionesses ran out of war wearing skirts at Old Trafford for the first game of the Euros on July 4th. Can you imagine what that would look like? That would just be silly. So she says for her, it's about choice and modesty. Let's not sexualize or objectify sportswomen or force them to conform to society's traditional views of femininity if they don't want to. Treat them as the elite athletes they are and let them dress for sports performance, allowing them to feel safe and comfortable. And this is, extends into schools where many PE departments still insist girls wear skirts or skirts for all sport, despite resistance from young women. When we hear that 45% of teenage girls stop playing sport because they feel body conscious, surely it's time to address what's actually putting them off. Let's have the conversation and give women and girls more choice. And then our genius producer, Shira, pointed out, polo shirts. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Who red. wears a polo shirt? <laughs> I'm it's definitely something that you get in your kit pack that doesn't Stays. make it out of the packet. Who and wears it in their free time? Who's keeping that industry alive? I don't understand. No. I don't understand. Certainly. Why are they the sport, the, the, the smart option for post-match? Why are they required? Even when I play golf at a golf club that requires you to wear a collar, I have one that has a little Mandarin collar mm -hmm. because I'm not necessarily always feeling that big old man collar vibe. So, thoughts? Mm, They're so boxy, so tight, tight on the arm and just like... Never have I felt my best in no. like a cotton polo. Men's no. polo. And that argument of we want you to look smart after a game. We don't. What part of wet hair, <laughs> if you shower, shorts and flip-flops or sliders is smart, but yet the polo's on. Yeah, what is this achieving? I'm not sure. It's like making it formal. Some It's not. It's that those two inches of fabric on the collar <laughs> turns everything that you're about to do after a game formal because mm, you're wearing somehow. it. Mm, somehow. somehow. Mm. Hey? Magic. It's amazing what a collar can do. <laughs> no, I think, I mean... If it were up to me, you would you would think that if someone wanted you to look smart after a game, they would just be like, you know what, look your best, and nobody would be selecting a boxy polo for that no, for no. that goal, right? So, it's I, I find I find it very weird. I dress I dress for the job I want to have at work, and never has that ever included a, a polo shirt. No, I mean <laughs> I dress smart many days, most days. Um, and there are versions of this that doesn't include three buttons and a collar. Um, I love the conversation, the points that uh, Sue made, particularly around wearing white, mm -hmm. because just because men can just, you know, blaze through with white any time of the month doesn't mean that, you know, that should be something that female athletes should worry about. Um, but also skirts and skirts for girls at school. Yeah, I actually remember having to buy one of them for um, for PE. And like the absolute horror to my dismay when that was the only, I went to an all girls grammar school. So it's not even like, I'll just buy the boys shorts. Like that there wasn't an option. And I was like, I feel absolutely ridiculous in this. It wasn't a time in my life that I wore a skirt and I'm still not, I've not hit the fact that phase yet, but. Um, maybe, maybe next year. Yeah, maybe, you know, fingers <laughs> crossed. It could happen. Um, Any day now. Yeah, it'll come in. And it's just, I if we've already like getting to a point where like 43% of girls are dropping out of sport aged um, 14, 16, why create more barriers? And I think if you think about sports like netball and hockey and athletics, when they're very strong in their own right in a women's sense, it's not like they're a male dominated sport and they need to look like the men. If they stopped wearing skorts, skirts and dresses and they changed, I think a year later, people wouldn't give a fuck. They'd be like, oh, I forgot you guys even did that. And it's quite interesting, especially when you, you look at um, hockey and netball, how many of those girls train in dresses and skorts? None of them. Mm. So if when you're choosing whatever you can wear to train in to help you perform and you don't even choose to wear it then, why the fuck on a match day are you putting it on? Exactly. It's like, imagine like imagine us going to rugby training and everyone wearing, if we all wore skorts to training and then on a match day, we'd be, oh, why have we got to put shorts on? Like you train in what you feel most comfortable in to perform and if none of them are training in skirts and skorts, hello, like, why are they playing in it? 
Do you know what this reminds me of? Sue's um, post reminds me of those images that you see of when women used to play tennis in knee length mm-hmm. or ankle mm. length skirts and how they used to play in Victorian times golf wearing like full on gowns. Mm. And you Every look at it and go, were. that is ridiculous. But we are still dealing with the minimized kind of hangover of that because yeah. we're still not dressing, re- dressing for practicality or performance. We're dressing for some sort of societal construct. I think I don't even know what we're it's dressing the choice. Because personally, I, I, I quite like wearing the skorts. I felt quite feminine and, mm. and that was my... That's I probably think. where we differ, really. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah I, mean, I think we do. Um, <laughs> I, I, in, my, in my downtime, I'm a big fan of a squirt. Yeah, but. so like I think that's where choice is a thing. I think, you know, personal opinion, yeah. I think it's an attractive... Um, I think the uniform for netball is very attractive u- uniform. Like we have to wear <laughs> at times men's shirts and shorts. So yeah. when you're looking at a femininity, mm-hmm. I think it's quite a nice un- uniform to have. But I totally get it. If you're not comfortable in it, mm. it it does hinder performance. I know girls who would much prefer to wear male uh, fitting kit for rugby. Mm-hmm. And I know girls who would much prefer female fitting kit for rugby. Mm-hmm. So, and again, the problem there would lie is, well, there needs to be some form of uniform if you're about to go on a pitch. That would be someone's argument. Could you make it work if someone preferred to wear a dress or someone to wear a pair of shorts and something? So is there is there space within a uniform, so let's say you are a netball team, for some of the girls to wear dresses and some of them to wear shorts made of the same fabric and tops? I mean, like the, the point of a the point of a uniform, right, is to designate what team you're on. I'm sure that we could solve that problem by like using the same colors, the same patterns, the number on the back, like the the name on the front, whatever, right? Like I don't think that anybody on the court is going to be like confused who's on like are you on my team because you're wearing a dress like you know what I mean mm. like I think I think all the, all the conversations about kit I, I, you know I think it requires everybody just take like a few steps back and think about what are we what like what is this actually about like what what is the point of a uniform for for any sport on the day and what are we trying to achieve by by making a, a choice about what we allow people to wear again on the day like if if it is just to designate what team you're on and allow people to play their best and feel their best and not be thinking about their outfit on the day, but just be like, I feel awesome, let's go. Then why are we overcomplicating it by having like all of these feelings about whether or not, you know, it's necessary that they have options. You know what I mean? Like mm. don't like In the first couple of times it will look weird, but after a while, I don't really think people notice it. You'd yeah. have to be a good engineer, I reckon, for this one with the scissors <laughs> and sewing machine. But I, I think, yeah, it's choice, isn't it? Yeah. It's it's hard. You can't deviate too far. Because, like you said, yeah, what's the match. point of a uniform? Yeah. It's so that everyone on the pitch is mm. uniform. Yeah, but um, you can tell. But, but, but yeah, it's a, it's an argument to be had. Yeah, and 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 think there is probably a way that you can make it. You know, like, you're never going to like make a hundred percent of people happy hundred yeah. percent of the time. But there is a way that you can like widen it to out a little bit. Yeah, you know, for sure. and get people options. So, are we going to talk about that Holoquins kit now for the big game? <laughs> <laughs> big shirt for a big dress. game. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a big shirt. Uh, no, I've, like, it's hard because if we didn't have that same kit, colour-wise, there would have been uproar if we wore the traditional Quinn's home kit that did fit. The problem is um, that, you know, Quinn's have said, they've acknowledged it was a fuck-up in a sense of, uh, we knew that we needed the girls to be wearing the same as the guys because it's mm-hmm. an inclusive game. Uh, and that's day, important. And it's it's a big it's a massive day for a club. Um, the the problem was it's actually a very small order. Uh, if you're thinking global, the brand mm. that supplies that to get any form of smaller or female fitted kit for a very one off piece is a difficult task in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Quinn's knew that they didn't. In hindsight, they know that they, that, you know, you could have tried something out, or, but um, it's something to learn from, and they have definitely learned from because this year we've got a very, very nice female fitted kit and yes. the option for girls who might not want to wear it as well in fit wise. So they've listened, and every uh, progress comes from. You know, yeah, you need a, a bit of a problem. For people to change. Totally. Yeah, to have yeah. the conversation. Um, and would it's... I wear it again? Probably not. Mm. <laughs> Maybe a bedtime. Mm. 
gardening. I don't know. Yeah, something. It looked like he had done some gardening in it already, that colour. <laughs> yeah, colour-wise, I'm not sure. I don't think it was anyone's. I wasn't so hung up on it, but it wasn't very Quinn's, was it? No. What, what is unfortunate is that it did dominate the conversation at a time where you guys, as the players said, you wanted yeah. the conversation to be about the performance yeah. and about the participation yeah. and about the platform. And the conversation around women's sport is often dominated. Well, we, we do tend to focus a lot on what it's wrapped up in well, rather this is than it. what it is. I think, you know, there were some posts about the, how the game went um, and girls that day didn't really care about the 100 people who were having Cocker Van at a pre-match men's dinner. They, they were so happy the fact that there was at point over 9,000 people sat in Twickenham Stadium watching us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just under 100,000 people on BT Sport. That's insane for a club yeah. rugby game. Yeah. That's insane for us. So when, um, you know, I got irritated that the, the focus had come off the fact that we'd beaten Wasps at Twickenham. I didn't mind that focus. That was all right. Yeah, no, she's fine with that. She's like, look at that. Look look over there. Look at their shirt. Look at that chicken they're eating. Um, Look at their shirt. We had the stoop walk. That was awesome. Like, we had fans, you know, Mm -hmm. woohoo, go beat wasps. Um, We had a post post match pitch walk and we had beers in the back afterwards. So, Pete Tong. Yeah, and Pete Tong was there. Pete Tong. Pete Tong was there. So, like, when people were talking about you know, men's pre-match dinners, mm. the shirts, um, other bits and pieces. To us, it was like, listen to the players. Listen mm-hmm. to what an amazing day that was for us. Mm. We don't care about the people sat in corporate. You're going to have that in any, mm. whether it's a men's game, females game, like whatever it is. Mm-hmm. People aren't going to watch every minute of women's rugby. There were TVs on with the game on in the in the corporate room. Um Quinns did an amazing job to to get the times closer together. Yeah, was, they had to fight yeah. tooth and nail, and that's work. A certain governing body yeah. to, to get us able to be on BT Sport because at, at first we were hours in front of we the. We were. Boys, I think it we? was like it was meant to be twelve o'clock, and the men's game wasn't till maybe half five thirty. Yeah, yeah half something five. like that. Which it's just it's as much as it was great. It was almost like ten steps forward, five steps back. Because mm. who's going to sit? in Twickenham for seven long hours. Time. Yeah. It was cold as yeah. well. It was a cold day. day. Yeah. I remember it being cold. there. It was freezing. Well, Not in our massive yeah. overcoat of I a mean, kit. You had enough um, <laughs> six layers on yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so we don't want to be too grateful, but you, the point you're making is that we should acknowledge the progress. Uh, see, I quite, you know, I was listening to Steve Borkwick on the, um, what's the, good, the Jake Humphreys uh, high performance, high performance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and i i know i'm might be on the other side of the fence i'm quite like the word grateful only because we as rugby players and he said as well like we have such a cool position yeah and um not many people can can perform at this so there's a that i think you should be grateful we've got a platform definitely not because um we, we've been undervalued and we should be, you know, like Oliver Twist, we, yeah, we, yeah. like mm-hmm. that type of thing. But, like, what an awesome platform. There's men's games who are, have been competing professionally for years and years and we'll never have 100,000 people watch our game. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I'm very pro, grateful, because wh- why not? It's I've got um, great experiences to, to cherish forever. Definitely. And Definitely. great experience with mates, family, got to experience that, Pete Tong and... Yeah, yeah, you know, so. I think like, two things can be true at the same time, right? Like, I, I feel really, really grateful for the life I have. I have no work but life balance, and I choose to do all of it, and Preach. I feel really lucky for yeah. all of it, right? You know, and anytime somebody is, you know, um, can, you know, says that by, I don't want to use the word complaining, but by talking about something that needs improving or could be improved mm. for everybody's benefit, um, that I'm being ungrateful or that the, or that the women's rugby community is being ungrateful by talking about these things. I don't think that's quite fair because it's, I think it's, you know, it's safe to say that none of us sat here do it because we don't really love it and don't, you know, have a lot of gra- gratitude for what we get to do because, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. You People wouldn't, are living a great life now. Yeah. 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 Through rugby. Right. Like, amazing life. Like girls are, um, like I said, on their fourth holiday. Yeah. You know, squeezing in before a pretty tough camp coming up. Yeah. But, you know. Um, so, like, we're in such a place from where we were years ago, even, like, let's say five years ago, 
big game at Twickenham on BT Sport with 100,000 yeah. people watching. Not which is chance. huge, which is a huge it's accomplishment, huge, right? huge, yeah. And right. because we're a developing sport, in the last, let's say, three years, that's when the media coverage has pushed us big time. Mm -hmm. This year, more than ever, mm. I think we can also be felt that media coverage. Definitely. Way more than, well, ever before. Yeah. And with anything that's developing, there's room to grow. So you mm -hmm. shouldn't not look at the fact that the kit was, let's say, what it was. Mm -hmm. But let's make sure we're at least acknowledging it and going to do something about it. Yeah, and I think it's important. Like the reason that people that there were enough people that's like saying stuff about the kit, right, was that a, that many people care that that rugby, women's rugby was on such a great platform and wasn't looking its best, mm. you know, in their opinion. And I don't think that necessarily. I know what you mean. Like you want them to focus on all the other cool stuff that happened the day because that was really cool. No offense, but <laughs> like, <laughs> so cool. she's like, was it though? Yeah. Was it Wasn't really? that cool? Was it? Um, mm. But you know, I think I think that. Sometimes, and I don't know, I don't know if it's because like so many of us like work in so deeply in this industry that sometimes it's it's really hard to like take a step back and look at like the bigger picture, like myself included. But um, I think it's important to remember that at the end of the day, rugby as a sport and growing rugby as a sport, especially in a professional era, is about um, creating entertainment piece. And like you said, like not everyone's going to watch all of a game and they don't have to. Not mm -hmm. everybody has to like, you know, meticulous, like like understand every single call the ref makes in order to to be um, a really important part of, of a rugby viewership. And everything that we can do to make that piece of entertainment more entertaining, more mm -hmm. fun to watch, more interesting to watch, more sellable to a wider range of people, the better. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um you know, from from my perspective, like, why wouldn't we do absolutely everything to make sure that it looks as cool as it can, including of, inclusive of kit? Because if you give people an excuse to talk about kit, then they have an excuse to not, to not recognize the other cool stuff that's happening or to just or. And also it's like a messaging thing. All right. Like, you know, if, if that's your first time being exposed to it um, and you see, you know, if it was another sport, it was my first time watching it and people like, you know, jogged out, like not looking their best. I'd be like, is this I'm, like. It's, it's, is this cool? Is it's this a cool? shame because it's it's, it was one of the biggest shop windows women's rugby had exactly. that year. And it's like you wouldn't have a shop window and then put something on a mannequin that doesn't fit. Yeah. But like regardless, the bigger picture is that it's so great. But I think women's rugby maybe gets into a space where we're so ready to be angry at everyone all the time. Yeah, and it doesn't serve anybody. That it's like, mm -hmm. oh my God, look, we're actually, yes, we've made progress. And yeah, the magnitude of the pro progress in the wider scheme of things might not actually be that big because we're still way far behind but it's give and take like yeah like literally grab what you can ignore the rest and okay that's on the list for the next to do but don't not appreciate because unfortunately we live in a world where if you get what you're given and then you don't say thanks or acknowledge it then people are far less likely to give it to you again mm -hmm. and that's shit but that's where we are and you can't just be in a space where we're so angry at everyone all the time something fucks up because it's draining on us as well. Mm. And realistically, we are, we're all pretty happy with the progress that's yeah, been made. Definitely. Listen so to definitely. the players, like, you know, there's there's things that are written out and you're like, that that was so far from what it hadn't I? It hadn't even mm. scraped to us, because I'm so used to seeing <laughs> girls playing crap kit. I, it, I, <laughs> yeah, it literally true. didn't even bother me. Yeah, I was I mean, more cared about the fact that we were playing in Twickenham and it was such a great day, and apart mm. from, like, minus mm -hmm. the score and all the rest of it, but that that was what was so good about it. And whether some corporate box was watching or not, I couldn't give less of a, sure. to be honest. Yeah, seriously. And yeah. that's the thing that off air we discussed just before the show started is that in some areas, women's rugby has a very different audience to men's rugby and they behave differently and they watch mm -hmm. differently mm -hmm. and they yeah. care about different things. But it has been, it's interesting that you talk about the anger and the frustration and the the perception around it, which is probably the thing that, I mean, we found ourselves in the middle of that storm. No, tell us more. <laughs> Completely. This is news, go on. Well, I mean, we had Rocky on the show to, you know, just to, like talk directly. Who said, you know, like she felt it's sad when people miss her off a list of, you know, the most capped players yeah. in England's history and said language is so important. It's frustrating when I get missed off lists and... Um, James's response needed more consideration. If you missed all of this, where have you been? Yeah. Um, James Haskell said something that was disrespectful and apologized. But male appreciation of the game is probably in a better place than it has ever been. 100%. Mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm talking personal. My dad will drive up to DMP 
which is a very long trek for any any squad, and they've got to do the trek down and watch a game. And, you know, my boyfriend's very supportive. I've got, like, all of the medical team, bar two, uh, a male. The coach is a male. But there's a huge abundance of men mm-hmm. who want the game to grow. Mm. Let's not create a divide on that. And know? that's the thing yeah. that I've said before. I have the biggest issue with people saying to James, we don't need you. Sit down. <laughs> yeah. And be quiet. No one needs your input on this. And I completely feel like we need every single voice. We kind voice. of do, especially like what James represents is this like whole laddish banter culture of rugby, which to be honest is very popular and why a lot of people, why a lot of blokes mm. play it and why he's still relevant now. I mean, and like, girls. I think, and we girls. love that. Yeah, exactly. Well, don't uh, we? We uh, love yeah, exactly. That part. And to say like, women's rugby isn't involved in that. It's like, actually, no, that's kind of, that's my vibe. So, mm. like, we are. And yep. for for too long, I feel like you're, you're in rugby club situations and people are like, oh, don't speak to the girls, we'll get in trouble, oh, we'll piss them off, we'll do that. And it's like, no, we're actually not all, yeah. like, super angry feminists. Yeah, and, like, hate we men. stand up for ourselves, but that doesn't mean I'm going to hate you because you're born with balls. That's fine. Like, mm. that's absolutely fine. Yeah. And I just think... When like, we jump on people's backs for making mistakes, it's like then they're afraid of saying anything ever. Mm. And it, yeah, it was a mistake. He apologized for it. But at the same time, to say we don't need him is mm. probably a bit of a lack of foresight because unfortunately, someone like him carries a lot of weight and represents a whole culture of rugby that we could really do with tapping into if if we got it right. And it totally exists in women's rugby. But unfortunately, I feel like anytime female players get like media opportunities it's all very like say the right thing do the right thing mm, well don't show any personality right. like just be totally straight down the line be grateful don't piss anyone off all of mm, that yeah it's... and it's like you know what fuck it like just be a, have a bit more character be a bit more that's why it's the great rest of it. that's why people listen. yeah like no one gets women to do after dinner speeches because they're like oh the girls aren't funny and it's like <laughs> yeah. actually no some people are like some people swear yeah. they say rude words yeah. and they've got good stories yeah and i yeah. just think there's more of that that can be seen i think that i think the difference, though, is that, you know, if if a if a female on Twitter says something that somebody doesn't like, they're going to for whatever, you know, the the feedback or like the general feeling is like, oh, women's rugby and women's rugby players are this. Mm. I don't think that men get that same thing. Like if, if one dude on the Internet who happens to play rugby says something I don't like, I don't go home and I'm like, well, all male rugby players are mm. shit. And like that's mm. what men's rugby thinks. I don't yeah. think that. Mm. And I don't think I don't I, I have a bit of a problem when people like including including like our community you know talk say like say like don't say that because like we don't want them I'm like she doesn't she's her own person like she's not me mm-hmm. like she's not speaking we don't we don't you know we didn't like vote like mm-hmm. the president of women's rugby and like she's not like speaking but sometimes for all people of us, speak you know? as if they are speaking for, for all. The, and so, yeah. like occasionally that happens yeah. and that's how people it's do viewed. it for men's too yeah too, right but yeah. for whatever reason like the wider i know what you mean like you have a point because people people hold i i think people hold like female females who do that as more representative of the community than they do for men mm. yeah. and I just think mm. that it's important especially when we're talking about like things that are said on Twitter like mm. those are personal opinions yeah. mm. and they're not and they might have like 1% overlap with other people you know on the others in, in different parts of their community but you know just because uh, just because a girl says something on Twitter doesn't mean that I've like stamped mm-hmm. it but vice versa like at the same time like just because a dude says something on Twitter that's not cute doesn't mean that I, exp- I think like the great like there are so many fantastic men involved in our sport and I don't I don't ever like, you know, it was sometimes I think they, they, then they express worry about like, oh, well, now I feel like I can't say anything. I'm like, no one's, this is not about you, my dude. Like you're golden. Yeah. I, I, I don't even know him. On I completely get that he took it personally, mm-hmm. but that's because I have been involved in the, literally the nucleus of where this podcast came from. Mm-hmm. And I guess we know, like, I couldn't believe, I honestly, I couldn't believe it when Alex called me, and remember, I was still listening and living in South Africa. I honestly thought I was being punked. He was like, <laughs> so we're going to do this podcast thing, and we think we might have Emily Scarrett actually keen on doing this. And I was like, hey, what am I doing with this? What would you want me involved with at all? But also, are you serious? You're going to start a podcast, and we're going to have sponsorship? You guys don't even have sponsorship for yourself. Mm. <laughs> How on earth are you going to get sponsorship for a women's podcast? And he was like, leave it with me. We're working on it. So I understand where this podcast came from. And we have talked so often internally about how massive the fact was that they managed to get us sponsorship before they got themselves sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And I 
get why he, and it wasn't the right approach. It wasn't the right response, but I have taken things personally before. And I yeah, completely get that immediate personal like feeling geez, have you not been paying attention? We have been here. We have been like mm-hmm. literally, it's a bit like you guys felt with with the, the Holoquins uh, big game shirts. You're like, we've been here. We've been pushing in so many ways. We've yeah. been getting so many of these things right. We've managed to get the games played together. We've yeah. managed to get yeah. both and of them on focus. TV. <laughs> We've gotten the women to also play at Twickenham. Can we just please get credit for the ones, for the things that we got right yeah. before yeah. we start getting deductions for the stuff we got wrong? But just like the kit, right? Like if you give something, something, if you give anybody or a group of people something bad to look at instead of the good, like, mm. you know, it's just easier to not do it and yeah. let them, like, 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 show, like show, show, just show the ref the best picture. Like don't. Don't like exist in the gray area if you can. Everyone yeah. makes mistakes though. Like everyone, yeah. everyone said something dumb yeah. or said something wrong or said something that's accidentally inappropriate that like, that, you know, used to be funny 10 years ago. And you're like, I actually had never thought about where that word came from or what that me- actually means or, you know, mm. like how many times have you seen somebody wear a costume that you're like, I don't know if you can wear that anymore, actually. Or like extra chiefs changing their logo, right? Like 10 years mm-hmm. ago, not a problem. And now everyone's like, maybe we should think about this again. You know, it doesn't mean that like, and, you know, somebody at Extra Chief 10 years ago was like, you know what, I, I'm super into racism. And no one is suggesting that, right? But it's just like as times change mm. and as communities, you know, we went, are understood in a different way, I think it's important that we just stay current, right? Mm. And, you know, at every, everyone, everyone, like I said, everyone's capable of making mistakes and putting their foot in their mouth and saying something dumb, myself included, on that list heavy. But um, just because just because you're corrected, I don't think means that you have to like, worry about the rest of your of, of what you've accomplished being discounted or feel the need to defend it because it, because at the end of the day like that should speak for itself and it's and it's it's sort of like it's you know it's sort of like you know a, a number of people I know or I've, I've heard people who are not of color like say the n-word when they're singing along to a song and you're like I don't know if you can do that anymore actually yeah you know and they're like oh god but they, they didn't wake up today and be like you know I'm gonna be racist no they're just you know it was something that hadn't been on their radar and now they're like maybe now that I've been talked about it, but like some people are like, you know what, I, I see what you're saying. And some people are like, no, I have black friends. Mm. And I'm like, you don't have to give me a list of the reasons in which you don't hate yeah. black people. Yeah. I just, just don't say that word. And I think it's a little bit like that. Like mm. nobody is like, I don't need, I don't need your, like your resume. I know it. We're mm. good. Mm. Just say sorry. The, like, the activism and the progress happens in those uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think though, like going back with that, the problem really went was like, it got pretty extreme for him. And I, and I, I actually messaged him. I, I said to him, you probably don't want to open another message from a female <laughs> rugby player right now. But, and I felt like it, you are just being you. And it's not excusing that I thought that was the right way to have gone about it. Yeah, 100%. But the level of, you know, I think he said he received death threats or whatever, you know, it went pretty bad. And I was like... This is so off topic. Like, this has gone so far now. Yeah. And um, everyone's, in, like you said, everyone's entitled to opinion. No, I, I can't imagine James or the guys who run the pod have gone, yeah, we're just going to completely diminish the fact that there's female rugby players out there. That's no, not the thing no. at all. It's, it's trying not to get so angry about it that it gets to this extreme where then we get tarnished with the brush of oh, female rugby players at it again. Um, and it, yeah, I, know, like, I know what you're saying. Who actually thinks that though? But it's, it's I think a lot it's of just, men do. Like Why? The, because one person gave like was an asshole on the internet. But it, it's like the volume and the size that that got. I feel like we're still in a place where women's rugby is like seen as a whole thing rather mm. than yeah. individuals and teams. It's still just like if one female rugby player speaks, they. And this happens in a lot of women's sport. It's like you're speaking for your whole mm. gender, and everyone who's mm-hmm. ever played rugby. Yeah. And it's like it totally, it's not at all, but. Because we're still so small, you you do your voice carries weight in the whole genre of yeah. it, and it, I think it, it, what disappointed me was just how much heat that whole thing got, and it was pretty negative from our community's end. Not saying everyone agrees with everybody, and yeah. that's great, but it was just a shame to see like he's probably done ninety nine things great, he's done one thing wrong, and then that's the thing that got the heat, and a lot of people gave it negativity before realizing the other things that it, it had and then it just got it just got so much press and I'm like oh my god this is getting more press than some of our actual games yeah <laughs> this is the thing. I'm like, focus. It, but I don't think it, it wouldn't have gotten that much if it was just I think I honestly don't think it would have gotten like the momentum it did if if 
it just at the very beginning, there would have been some sort of like, whoops, you're right. Like rugby is not inherently male, you know, like yeah. the, the response about how like, if it was on the other podcast, you know, if it was on this one, you would have put Rocky. And it's like, well, it's rugby isn't like by default male and then everything else has to be like a subcategory of it. You know, like rugby is a community for everybody and just like it should include all types of the sport on that list. If you're the most capped, it's not, you're not. But, saying yeah, most yeah. Capped yeah. So, but then where's Amy Garnett in that? Yeah, she, exactly. She, you exactly. know, that's yeah. the yeah. other thing. Just there, be there's like, so much but bits to it that got kind of missed out or it was like, it felt like people were driving their, what uh, their motive and what they wanted out of it. And it was like, right, we're, we're kind of not even getting the real hard facts out there at the minute we're just focusing on someone made a slip up someone's got really angry about it and then next thing we've got this like war between yeah I think know? I think I mean I I, don't, I can only speak to what I saw on the internet but to me it looked like it there was like a slip up and someone said something about it and then somebody was like you know there was no just like you know oops sorry whatever mm. it, like that I don't I don't think that like I'm not excusing. Obviously, nobody should be like sending someone death threats on the internet. That's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, don't see. do that. I see a therapist. But like, and you that's... know what I mean. But I, I think that I, it wasn't. I don't think it was as simple as like someone made a mistake and then everyone was like, fight, you know, firing blows. I think, I think it's just really easy to say because everyone makes mistakes. It's really easy to just say, you know what, that was not intentional because it wasn't right. Like I get, like you said, nobody oh. woke up the day and you're like, you know what, we don't care about. Yeah. Like they made a whole. Mm. Could say like, look around. Like clearly they care, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, but um. Just like, just like all, like, you know, with the, with the kit, everything, like if, why for any, any entertainment piece, whether it be sport or something that talks about sport, like show, show the best picture to the, mm -hmm. to the ref, to the yeah. audience, you know, don't mm -hmm. give them. And if you, and if you do make a mistake, everybody does, right. Just, just say it just be like, whoops. Two things come out of this for me. One, we need to have a wider variety of voices that people perceive to be speaking for the women's game. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. A. Yeah. And that is the the emphasis here is on the fact that we have four voices at this table today, <laughs> three of whom have never been in this room before. <laughs> and so we're trying to do that work by Definitely. creating platforms yep. to have more mm -hmm. people speak for the women's game so that it's not just one or two or one limited perception out there that women's rugby is one thing, which is the whole point of having you all around yep. this table. That's the one thing that comes out of this for me. The second thing that comes out of this for me is that there are people who are looking for a stick to beat James Haskell with because he just gets under their flipping skin. <laughs> and B, also, that there was a lot of pent-up anger there that was released at one thing that probably came from a very long line of things. And the one thing I regret, uh, I didn't ask Rocky this in the moment, and this is like, this is the stuff that, li like, I wake up at four in the morning, I'm like, oh, gosh, I should have asked you that, <laughs> is how many times have people forgotten you off lists? This is the one that got attention, but it's happened so many times before. And that's probably why it got the heat. And that yeah, is why it's got the heat. But it got the heat. The heat is there now, and that's something that I rejoice you just, in. You guys are just the scapegoat. It? I really? love that there's, the, that there's heat now. Someone actually turned around and cared this time, and people yeah. got incredibly angry. Yeah. And the men at my work were asking me about this, and I was at a table full of male rugby journalists, and all they were talking about was the women's game. Not, unfortunately, the actual play, yeah, the game. like the actual rugby. But people were talking about women's rugby, full stop, and it was happening. And I did have that moment where I was like, well, you know what? I am grateful for all of this, even yeah. if it does tank this Any really... press is good press, right? Yeah. 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 Even if it does tank this really fancy boat that they built us. But it was a moment for me. Now, we have seen examples of great allyship. Give us your favorite example of male allyship. What do we want if we could put in an order... Um, I think for me anyways, I think Ugo does is probably like every time someone asks who the best, who's doing it the best, I, he always jumps to mind because, um, he's not afraid of, of supporting the game, like, like in publicly, um, and verbally and, and speaking up when he needs mm -hmm. to, but he also doesn't always, he does it in a really authentic way. Like he, he doesn't need there to be a camera around mm -hmm. for, and to be available if you need to talk about something and he doesn't, you know what I mean? He's just... He's just like genuinely, he doesn't care if it gets him any press. He doesn't care if it makes him look good. He's like, if you need to call me and ask me about something, like, you know what I mean? Investment of energy, time, resource, access, mm -hmm. experience, not just uh, on profiles and platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of really, really fantastic men who work in our industry who, who like tick off those boxes and, and who, aren't, who aren't there for any other reason other than like this is the, the industry that they want to work in and the role that they want to do. Mm -hmm. And they're very, very capable. And 
and and just by nature by nature of of the way that they conduct themselves at their at their places of work or what they what they choose to do in their spare time are fantastic allies right but i you know there are also i've also seen you know like males in our industry who are in it because they for lack of a better way to say it like they couldn't they couldn't hack it in the men's game so they went somewhere less competitive yeah. right but like i'm i'm never I, I would never like lump those two together right like oh. everyone makes their own resume in my books I'm here for allyship that points to where you can watch the game and why it's a good game to invest in. Mm. <laughs> Those are the Absolutely. two things I yeah. want. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I know he's a, not the most liked person, but Brian Moore, he's doing a lot of commentary uh, on the women's game and exclusively in the women's game, I think now. Um, and for someone who's so synonymous with traditional ideals within rugby and has played in an era before it was probably even acceptable to like take women to a game to now be commentating on it and giving it the same sort of energy that it gives the men's game. And I think, and a lot of women's commentary initially was like, Oh, that's a shame. And Oh, she'll be disappointed with that. And it's like, no, mm. like with, with still athletes, like if someone drops a ball, that's not like unlucky. It's like, that's poor. That's you know, not like, good enough. You know, like, like yeah. Rocky says, language is so key yeah, with our definitely. with our sport. Is painting an image that yeah. this is just as tough, competitive. We still put our bodies on the line. Exactly. Um, it's the same thing. It's right? the same thing. Like, like why we might do we... not be as fast yeah. as, as some of them? But you I know, know, if, if everybody is. was full time, I'm sure we'd have one or two. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cup, you know, language use it. So it is so important. I don't know if this bugs you guys, but it really bugs me when commentators only call people by their nicknames or their first names. Because then it just sounds like, you know, it just sounds so like backwoodsy. Like you would never like imagine if somebody was like, you know, like commentating on the men's game and instead of saying Joe Marley, they're like, all right, Joe's. And now it's like Joe's got oh, the ball. So fast. It's so weird, you know, yeah. it's a bit. Mm. It's true. Yeah, that that's true. true. I get, and that's, I think, because our pool of um, players, it's going to be so different, let's say in maybe five, in the next five to ten, because you've got the the class of players that are out now in the Prem. Mm -hmm. They'll be retiring or people will start to retire that pool of players are so, so good now because the investment has been so high. Mm -hmm. So people at the moment, you know, people who have been given the jobs of commentary and so on, they're exposed to a whole new product of women's rugby. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so different. Like I was saying to Shira, we were playing when I was like under 15s, 18s with Shira out the back. Remember us training? You had Maggie Alfonsi, Hannah Gallagher, and you had one floodlight in Cockfosters, which isn't the most glamorous a place to drive, and the seconds had to use the outskirts of the light. So you don't know really know what you're doing. Those were the what those girls were exposed to. Eight years later, you've got um, you know, we moved to Allianz Park to train. Like that's an amazing facility. And then you've got like the Quinn's day programs insane like what you've got on on offer there mm -hmm. so imagine the whole game we're talking commentary um people's experiences traveling to world cups to cover games and so on it's going to be so well um like the foundation is going to be so good because of what we've been exposed to like it's in an unbelievable place and it's going up like the the fan base everything's going up people are now following individual players not because they play for their country but they're going to the stoop like they get so many and they're going to Worcester's ground they're going mm -hmm. you know like people are identifying with players and that's where the focus needs to be on it's not about that so much in the negatives let's build brands of the girls like mm. we're so marketable so we have lives like we have like very legit. diverse lives um experiences stories mm. There's things to be it's people so to follow. Businesses. It's so interesting. Businesses. Hello. I don't I, I don't understand how there's not more like people making advantage of it. Oh, Especially see. like when like um I don't know if you guys saw the piece that like Joe Marler was talking about, um, like how male players should should show more of their personalities. And, mm, yeah. and I really think that that's something that like like you said, the women's game could offer the men are very interesting as well. Hmm. But you know, like you said, there's huge personalities. There's so many interesting things about the the playing group and in, in the prem and and the lives that people lead mm -hmm. that it can do nothing but good for the sport by having that be broadcast. And same with the men. You know, like I think the the cool thing that the women's game has as a whole is the advantage to look at like how men the men's game professionalized and grew and mm. not just like replicate it for the sake of replicating it mm. or for the sake of calling it equality mm. by be like you know what how could we do this a little bit better I think other sports do a really fantastic job of marketing themselves and their players and the mm -hmm. personalities and 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 turning personalities into brand like the like the NBA and the WNBA are like 
absolute classic. Yeah. This people buy shirts for yeah. a person, yeah. right? And 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 by because people get to know them, like and the, and and this and the way that the sport, the governing bodies of that of those sports, and and the 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 league itself kind of elevates that as part of as part of like what it means to be a fan of that yeah. sport I think right. is really clever I think it's something that we could emulate both in the yeah. men's game and the women's game in a really powerful way because you know like the like men, men's participation numbers and viewership numbers have been in decline so like although 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 rugby as a whole is growing it's mostly growing because of women's participation but it can do, like for the whole group at the end of the day like we are you know we it's the same sport like you said and we all love playing it like I think anything we can do to market it in the best way possible, whoever's on the field is, is in the best interest. And we yeah. have so much to market in the women's yeah, game. Yeah, I think the women's rugby has got such an opportunity to sort of like refresh the brand of rugby because mm-hmm. I think everyone knows that rugby is probably dying. I think I heard a stat before that was the number one reason in Bath why they didn't get continued repurchase of um, season tickets was death, which tells you a little bit about the average age of a season ticket mm-hmm. holder at Bath. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um and but women's rugby is capitalizing on a much younger audience and like some of the work we did at matter for the red roses this year was yes it was all about in the rugby but it was all about the individuals and what they brought to the game mm-hmm. because you're seeing more and more that fans are following players exactly. first not team first yeah. and yes like they'll follow the players around the teams because like i think the fastest selling shirts money night in money night money united history were the two us female players that came over and and signed for wow. them because mm-hmm. people were so invested in about those yeah. players coming over and then you're saying around oh well what are the personalities that women's sport can give like will it ever compete with the men's viewership well chelsea women fc's um instagram uh page last year got more interactions than 12 male premier league clubs so that actually put them, I think it put them like seventh on the list of, of Premier League. And that's like including men, men's and women's. They were seventh in, in, in all Premier League Brilliant. men's and women's football. And it just shows like the kind of content they put out. Yes, it is obviously about football and performance, but it's also so personal about the players and what they bring to the game, what yeah. they stand for and their values and stuff. And I think that's what makes female athletes like literally the most marketable athletes in the world because they have values. They stand for hard work. Like you have all of these influencers out there that make a quick buck and they go and that that's the fastest form of marketing in the world is influencer marketing Mm -hmm. Mm. so and then you've got female athletes like athletes they're really trustworthy they work hard and then the women's one they've got all these personal stories as well Mm. like oh my god like cash should be like fucking coming in from every door but it's not because you need the exposure you need people to know this yeah Yeah, marketable and it's the same as any business you got to sell it like somebody has got to be at Mm -hmm. the forefront saying these girls have a story um the, the game is growing it's only going to get better. Investment needs to come. Yeah, and you put yeah. money in now. In ten years' time, you're going to be adding four zeros to it. So do it now. In a, easy, yeah. easy, right? Like in in no other sport would you be able to buy in for so little. Yeah, and have such a and sort of have such a huge payout. Yeah. Massive and like, return. And mm-hmm. like like what you said, uh, you know, what you're talking about, um, like will will women's sport, what rugby, women's rugby, women's sports ever match like the men's viewership numbers? I think like like how do you define viewership numbers, right? Men's rugby, when it professionalized, it was the late '90s. There was no social media, right? Mm. Like viewership numbers, yeah, exactly. butts and seats. Those were like the big, the big ways the cash came in. To, it came like came in the door, right? Yeah. And that's not the way it is anymore. Yeah. Sometimes like the, the yeah. like, a lot of the money comes in through who, how many followers something has on, on yeah. Instagram, right? And that's how you sell your. The world rights. has changed, yeah. right? Yeah. So like like how are we how are we measuring success if it's going to be by butts and seats? I don't think that's necessarily the most accurate way to, to get together one how much something's grown but also to like how marketable something is because it, it and, and and also who are you marketing to like the the average demographic for for a, a men's uh, a men's league especially in like 1998 is not the same no. set of purchasing habits that we are marketing to right yeah like yeah. w- women make most of the, d- the buying decisions in their homes. They engage with their interests it's in a like much different way. It's like 70% of a home mm-hmm. purchasing decision is made by women. Mm-hmm. So why would you not use a woman to market it to them? Exactly, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And and the way that that women like back up their interests and their hobbies with with money spent in the market is extremely different than the average mm-hmm. male, mm-hmm. especially in like that, you know, 16 to 20, 25, 28 mm-hmm. year old like demographic. You know, like look at someone like Simone Biles. Like I follow her on Instagram. I cannot name a single gymnastics. Like, you know, there's bars, you know, and like, and there's a Rolly trampoline. Roly polies. Yeah. There's, yep. there's the ribbons the sometimes. <laughs> yep. You know, I watch, I watch, I watch it happen and I'm like, that looks complex. Yeah. I have no understanding Ow. of it. I think she's Ow. really Ow. cool. I think she's really fucking cool. Right. And like, I saw somebody posting on, on, on somewhere about how like, they're like, I would love to wear a Simone Biles jersey. And then everybody like retweeting this. 
And I'm like, this isn't even a sport that has jerseys. Like no. women are like, I like that. Can I throw money at it? You know, like it's mm. just, a, it's just a, it's a different, it's a different world, right? Than it was in the late nineties. And it's a different like demographic and like the, the potential like return on investment you can make if you invested in women's rugby and mm. women's sport in general is just much, it's much different and it's much broader than I think a lot of people realize. This is well, where the clubs need to come in. Yeah. yeah. Big time for us. Right. So, so give us that. I think we've agreed and made our point, which is, I think everyone would concur, uh, the sport, women's sport, but particularly women's rugby, viable investment, tick. The potential is all there. Businesses and brands just need to get on board because this stuff is going to grow. And a lot of it is down to marketing. And you guys are, yeah. all three of you, busy doing so much more than just the work on the field. I think the work you're doing off the field is massively impactful and so beautifully progressive. It's been a fantastic conversation. And thank you for coming all the way down here and for having the uncomfortable conversation. And I know there's so much more here that we need to cover. So we will have to be back. I mean, we will just have to do this at some point again. The state of the game requires uh, that we get it all out there. So thank you so much for thank coming you. join. Thanks for uh, us on the good, the scars and the rugby for the penultimate time this season. Uh, we'll see you next time for our end of season do. Uh, this has been a Folding Pocket production led by our beautiful producer, Shira Kilgallen, with her new hairstyle. <laughs> we'll be back next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>